this is the magic of open source, is that sometimes you discover user communities you did not realize existed. And so uh, we have Cliff Misson here to tell us about the eGranary project, which is putting Viewfind in a lot of places where I did not realize it was. <laughs> All right, Damien, thank you very much. And I'm, uh, I'm um, pleased to be able to present about our digital library. And uh, I owe you all a debt of gratitude for developing this software because it's, uh, it's proved really useful out in the field. And um, I want to try to recruit you guys to, um, to our, next, uh, our next layer of adventures. So, um, I, I, um, I teach at UNC Chapel Hill, but I also run a nonprofit called uh, Wider Net. We've been around for about 20 years, um, focusing on people who don't have access to the internet, the underserved. We have two components. One is um, I have a lab at the university where we do a lot of research and development. I haven't done programming for ages, but I've got a lot of students who come in I lead them through doing programming projects and uh, uh, cataloging and librarianship and all kinds of stuff. And then we have a nonprofit outside. Those of you who work inside a university know how much fun it might be to buy a thousand hard drives and sell them to people in other countries inside a university. No. So, <laughs> <laughs> so we founded a nonprofit so we didn't annoy so many people at the university with our activities. I want to start with. Um, I encourage you to curb your internet enthusiasm. Uh, there, uh, we, we get to live inside this bubble where we have all this internet connectivity, thousands of megabits of, of internet connectivity. And uh, just to remind us that there's a, there are a lot of people who can't access the internet. I estimate about 5 billion. Um, there are some groups that say, oh, half the, half the world has the internet now. And there are some people who are really bought into that uh, idea of half the world having access to the internet. And they kind of, they extrapolate um, and uh, exaggerate. Um, but I, this, is, this is a slide that shows internet bandwidth and gigabits per region. And you can see Africa, this is a little red line on the top here. This is the amount of bandwidth they're consuming. So yeah, there are a lot of people who might be on the internet, which means they have an email account or they set up a Facebook page, but that doesn't mean they're on the internet every day. It means that once every couple of weeks they go to an internet cafe. Once in a while, like when I was, I was just in Kenya, um, I literally had to, you know, ran out of internet and I had to go down to the store and buy a little chip and, you know, scrape, you know, scratch off card and type a new code into my computer so I can have another gigabyte of internet. Um, and I paid for that gigabyte of internet what the average income is for uh, monthly income for a Kenyan, right? So um, they do, some people have access to the internet, but it's not our internet. Their internet and our internet are completely different. Um, and their systems are unreliable. Like, internet outages go on for weeks, whole universities will disappear um, because of one thing or another. A satellite dish goes bad, a bill doesn't get paid. Electricity can go out several times a day. 34% um, of hospitals reported having reliable electricity in Sub-Saharan Africa. My son, when I was doing my Fulbright, got, um, fell down on the playground and had a very deep wound from a rusty, rusty metal. And we literally had to hold the lamps over him um, and operate his breathing using hand pumps while the doctor put him under and went digging around to find the rest that was inside of it. Um, so these, the, the conditions that people uh, live under there are significantly different than what we um, experience here. So very few people have really experienced a truly functional system. I'm gonna guess Villanova spends 100 million or more a year on ITS and all this infrastructure and, and, and all that. They, there are whole countries in which they wish they had 100 million for all of the universities for everything. So the, it's just it just uh, just uh, terrific uh, differences here, um, and even people who are trying to make things work talk about how just hard it is. The electrical company doesn't deliver electricity. The internet company doesn't deliver internet. Everybody's working really hard to get stuff done, but it's just not easy. 
And it's not just a lack of internet, it's a lack of a lot of things. And um, uh, I gave a lecture once in a hall where when I approached the hall, I saw there was a bunch of junk, like bed box springs and things like that piled up outside the hall. And I thought, this is really sloppy. You know, that, that, you know, that could be gotten rid of. And went into the hall, there was no electricity in the hall. I have got, I'm running a little generator and doing my presentation with a, um, uh, with a uh, projector. And there are about, um, there's about 70 seats in the hall, 150 people filling them. And what I found out, the junk outside the window was for people to climb up so they could get their head in the window to be able to hear the lectures that were going on inside the hall. And at one point we had to stop the lecture while the people inside the hall negotiated with the people in the window to let in a little light so they could take notes. So completely different uh, um, situations there. Here's a map of books borrowed worldwide. And this little skinny uh, hairline thing here, that's Africa. So it's not just that they don't have the internet, it's they don't have access to information. And there's no going to the local library because the internet's not working type of uh, solution for them. This is a library in Piki, Ghana. There are five educational institutions in the town. This is the, uh, this is the library. This is the whole library. Um, and poor Charles, I mean, he, he does everything he can. He was, he was hitting me up and going through my backpack and trying to find readable items. <laughs> Can I have this? Yeah, you can have that. <laughs> okay, mobile broadband prices. Um, so what people pay for on their phone in the in, you know in the in the Western world, the developing world, 0.07% um, of our uh, uh, gross uh, gross income is spent on that. Uh, 15 times as much in developing countries. So not only is it rare to be on the internet, it's also terrifically expensive. Um, and so. People, um, people manage things differently. Um, um, the, the number one form of communication with a cell phone in Africa is a flash. You dial somebody, you let it, let it ring twice, and you hang up. It didn't cost you anything, but you were able to signal somebody. Time to pick me up at school, drop off, you know, do something, right? It's just a, just a flash, hello, but without using any money. Fixed broadband prices in, 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 in some countries, we're talking um, uh, in terms of uh, percentage of the gross national income, uh, 2,000 times in the Central African Republic, 2,000 times the gross national income to get a fixed broadband. So almost everybody's dependent on some kind of Wi-Fi or, or G, you know, GPS, GSM uh, system to get on board. And those are, those are sketchy. So we developed this thing called the Ugrani Digital Library. And um, just passed one around here, but it's a, it's a hard drive. It's a six terabyte right now hard drive with uh, um, 3,000 websites on it. And the whole idea is that it is, the, the granary in the African context is the place where people store their seed for next year's crop. And that granary is always in the middle of the village, near the house. It's being guarded all the time against, uh, you know, rats and birds and things like that. Because if they lose that seed, they lose next year's crop. And the idea is to be able to put the information inside the institution, inside the organization, so they can protect and run and manage their access to information. So we're basically replacing bandwidth with store width. We're just taking these, right now it's about 35 million documents and putting it inside the organization where they have uh, free and fast uh, access to it. Um, we have a lot of librarians working on, on pulling this stuff together. Multimedia, audio, video, these are things that people, uh, if we look at the, you know, we just looked at the previous slide with this tiny little slice of bandwidth for the entire continent of Africa. Um, people aren't watching videos, they're not doing, um, they're not doing audio. They avoid PDFs like the plague, because you push and I click on a PDF and then nothing happens. And it doesn't tell you, hey, this is gonna take 15 minutes or two hours, it just sits there. Um, I, a, a colleague of mine in uh, Northern Ghana says, he, he calculates, he spends about $2 per YouTube video to download YouTube over his phone. My YouTube consumption would go down dramatically if I were paying that kind of money. Um, so what this does, you know, it, it, a lot of places it, it, it 
they use it in a hybrid situation. You know, the bulk of their bandwidth comes from the intranet, um, and uh, and then they then they get to choose what they use the internet for. So the mission is, you know, the most biggest bang for the buck with the least amount of internet. And these are concepts that have been around forever, right? Um, an old, old joke from uh, from from my day, uh, where you know, we'd say, "Never underestimate the bandwidth of a station wagon full of magnetic tape," right? <laughs> This is just old caching. It's been around since forever, but we're just using it in a, um, in a, uh, a new package. So thousands of people have access on their local area network, even when the internet connection is broken, and uh, um, uh, and they can be watching videos. Like TED Talk will open up in five seconds. It's a completely different. So we're at a six terabyte drive, over 2,000 installations around the world. And we're in 27 prisons here in the US as well. There's another group of people who can't be on the internet. Some of them are there because they were on the internet. So <laughs> they, have, uh, they have their own offline uh, internet. Uh, on top of a lot of open source material, we've also gotten permission from over 2,400 authors and publishers. We just contact them and say, look, you know, the bulk of the world can't see your website. Can we make a copy? And most, most people agree. Um, so uh, it's, it's um, a huge amount of resources. Um, it's what we think they're very, very wickedly fast. And hey, we have a built-in search engine and catalog. Thanks, you guys, um, <laughs> to make it look just like the internet. So let me, let me uh, hit the alt tab here, pop over to a screen. Hmm, I need to update my recovery media. It's really insistent. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Can our uh, distance audience see this? So, okay, so this is what the eGrantor interface looks like. And uh, if I click on Life Water Canada, um, or I click on, a little slow there, DFID, it looks like I'm at, I'm, looks, like, looks like I'm at their website, it's a common URL. Um, and I can click on their index of outputs and um, go into system management. It's just like browsing. It looks like I'm on the internet, except all of this is contained in that little hard drive. Um, completely offline. So we do, we do as much as we can to make it look like it's the real internet without, um, uh, uh, without a lot of uh, compromises. We have a total full text search. Do a search for water well. We'll come back and say, hoo, hoo, uh, 42, uh, 492,000 results. That's a bit much. Uh, I can go into my advanced search and uh, do some uh, do some quotes and, and other things to reduce those results. And then, yay, we've got a catalog. And I have to tell you, we do analysis of the Apache logs that come out of this, and about 90 to 95% of the first hits come out of the catalog. We've all been Googleized, right? We've, like, we've mastered Google. No, Google has mastered us, right? And our brains have, been sh have shifted to this sort of word-finding kind of uh, paradigm. That's not the case for most people who haven't been on the internet. It took us five, ten years to get used to that stuff, right? Um, so for them, being able to come in and say, I am interested in medical sciences, click on a button, and get results in medical sciences are really important. And here's where uh, your fine work comes into play here. Um, so this is, this, is, this is hugely helpful. Um, you know, 35 million documents, we have maybe 60,000 things cataloged so far. But our librarians go through and try to find the, you know, sort of the best of breed of, of, of this material and highlight it. And one of the things we're doing now is to shift them to a mode where we're going to, we're actually going to have inmates and people out in the field doing cataloging as well. Because we just want to grow this cataloging process. And we're, right now we're planning a catalogathon. So you can get a team of librarians together and compete with other librarians and see if you can raise money and do a bunch of cataloging. <laughs> right. So everything we can do to catalog is really important because that's, that uh, 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 makes it uh, so much easier for people to use this. Let's see, I'll go to the TED Talks. And all of this is coming from a server in Chapel Hill. So a slight delay here, but we're in a media rich world. Let's come down here. Personal DNA is testing is here. So this 
blows people away. Imagine that you are a pig farmer. Thank you, yes. <laughs> okay, so, um, <laughs> but yeah, I was just doing a training in Malawi and I was showing people how to make their own web pages and set them up on the system and stuff like that. And I'd given the class an assignment and I turned around uh, at one point, I, I was working on programming a switch and I turned around and there's like, you know, eight people sitting there, you know, clearly you know, hung, tang, tang, tongue hanging out of one side of their mouth and they're trying to figure out how to get their web page to work correctly. And there's one guy who's just leaned back and he's just zoned out. And I said, oh, I've lost this student. I need to get him plugged back in. I go over to him. I walk around behind him. He's watching a TED Talk. <laughs> it's like, okay, never mind. We're good. <laughs> um, but that's one of the features that we have here. On top of this, we have a full WAMP stack. So we make it possible for people to create their own web pages and uh, upload their own content and build databases and do all that kind of stuff as well. So it's like ITS in a box, not just <clears throat> the web, you know, web services. So if I come back over here and I click on the CIP button, yeah. Okay, I'm gonna log in to the community information platform. Login is me, one of my favorite users here. Okay, so I just log in, so we have LDAP security, and I have four websites that I have access to. So an instructor can have a website for every course that she teaches. The students can all have a website for every course that they're in. Unlimited number of courses. I'll click on cliff.eg, and there's my beautiful website. This is actually just the file browser for the website. Um, so if I move this over here. Okay. Um, scroll down here, and here are all the files that make up my website. If I click on index HTM, um, there, I've got my uh, my most excellent homepage. And if I go back to the CIP editor, I can click on another button here, the editor button, and that page will open up in a full page editor. So I can come in and uh, um, highlight, change a font, change a size, change a color do all that kind of stuff. So really important, instead of being you know, people not just make, not just creating information consumers, but information creators, putting them in the, in the position to uh, develop the resources that they need for their work. And the most powerful button right here is just upload a file. With this, they're prompted to browse their cell phone, their hard drive, whatever, and upload files and start sharing material, their own information with each other. This is, you know, giving people the tools to digitally tell their story um, has something something that's been severely lacking all across the board. And this is one thing I'm, I'm most proud of in terms of the work that we do is uh, giving people this ability to do this. At the end of the day, I can uh, scroll down to the bottom here, zip up my whole website, send it off to somebody, mount it on a server somewhere, right? But it is available to me. Um, on, on this server here, let me hit refresh. You see my changes, my title. So a lot of a lot of Web 2.0 stuff built in. Okay, back to my presentation. That's not it. So 80% of new installations these days are people coming back to get more. They've done one installation and they say, well, that worked really well, and they're coming back and doing more. Uh, we've been accredited for use in, in, in uh, community colleges that are doing post-secondary and secondary uh, uh, you know, high school diplomas in Texas prisons. The Nigerian University Commission has adopted it. In Papua New Guinea, they've, they've rolled it up to 15 of uh, their teacher colleges. A local telecom provider even put the eGranary on their cell phone system so people can freely access the eGranary um, over the cell phone system. Uh, if they want to avoid internet charges. There's some teachers from Papua New Guinea making their first web pages. We also do something where we create user-friendly portals. We take collections of information that are relevant to certain groups of people 
and, um, and, and pull those together. So I'm going to hit Alt Tab, go back to my browser here, and hit the Home button. And I'm going to click on Portals, and I'm going to move this again. All right. Um, so you can see we created portals on all kinds of stuff. Coco Ondo, hey, this is my personal favorite. I'm really into chocolate. So everything you need to know about chocolate in one place. <laughs> and we, we put this together for uh, cocoa growing communities in West Africa. Um, uh, during the Ebola crisis, we put together Ebola Pocket Library. Everything from uh, you know, uh, PSAs and posters to research papers and all of that, all of it on one chip. And we got special permission from all the authors and publishers so that collection could be copied at will so that we could spread information faster than the, than the disease. Um, probably the one that has the most, uh, has had the biggest impact. We have a number of medical nursing and midwifery portals that we've put together. These are now used in dozens of medical schools uh, across the world. And um, if I go into, let's see, say anatomy and physiology here, embryology, let's go for the multi-dimension human embryo, pick an embryo, pick a, a time of an embryo, look at some photographs, see some animations. I visited, I visited a university in, um, in Ethiopia a couple of years ago, 12,000 students. They had 600 books in the library. And most of the students did not own any books. Some of the professors didn't have the books for the courses they were teaching. They were working out of the notes that they took when they were back in graduate school. And to go from that kind of information poverty overnight to 35 million resources and multimedia, it just blows people away. People literally get drunk. I was, I was actually kidnapped once in Nigeria. I was doing a presentation, we were doing a training. Um, at the end of the day, I said, it's 4.30, time for me to go back to my hotel and get some dinner. And one of, the, one of the students said, you're not going anywhere. Somebody get him some food, right? And I didn't make it back to my hotel until midnight. <laughs> but people just get so excited about it. They can't believe, they can't believe that somebody would give this stuff away. Literally, they'll sit with the mouse hovering over a, um, over a link saying, is it okay that I look at this? Yeah. Is it okay that I save it? Totally, right? There, you know, we've had 20 years to get used to this idea of sharing information. But I remember in 1996 going out and doing consulting at companies and saying, hey, you guys take all your information and put it on the web so everybody can see it. And they would, they would look at me and say, what are you smoking at that university? Right? But we've gotten used to that idea. This is just starting to settle in for uh, uh, people who haven't had access to the internet around the world. So, so these user for user friendly portals really critical, really important, a good way to get. Uh, um, yeah, um, get people uh, the information they need as quickly as they want it. So let's talk about the eGranary stack, or at least the, the the findability stack. We use Apache as our um, uh, as our web server, we've seen Solar, and then Viewfind to present it. And um, uh, yeah, some of you might have been giggling at our presentation because this everything here is like eight years old, and we haven't updated things for a while. And we're in the process of now uh, doing that, updating everything. And we have to go you know, all the way back to the bottom of the stack and do all these upgrades that we've been uh, uh, seducedly avoiding <laughs> for way too long. Um, but, uh, so I've got a group of students this semester, uh, or this year, that are going to be working on, um, getting all this stuff upgraded and updated. Um, and we're trying to, one of the things we want to do with the, on the granary side of thing, where a server that's sitting in an institution that's serving, you know, hundreds or thousands of people, um, we want to be able to, when they upload their local content, we want to be able to index it so when they do a search in the search engine, that content shows up alongside everything else. In the same way, we want them to be able to catalog things that they've uploaded and have those show up 
in the catalog. Uh, when they do a search. We're also looking at, at uh, some kind of open source ILS so that we can, uh, they, because some of these, you know, they might have, um, you know, 10,000 items on the shelf and they want to get them, uh, make them accessible too. And um, there's, there's not a lot of agreement on a good open source ILS and a lot of these uh, universities, they might invest in one, they buy a commercial one, but after the first year or two, they can't afford to, maintain and you know, pay for upgrades. And so they've got, uh, yeah, I, I, I still go to universities where they're using a Windows-based Microsoft, you know, uh, Access Database ILS that they got 10 years ago. Um, and so uh, we're looking at uh, updating that with, with the hope of having every, in, everything integrated in the same search. But there's something else we're doing that's really different. We're, we're getting small, okay? Um, there's only so much we can do with hospitals and libraries and universities and secondary schools and whatever. Um, but the need is really fantastic. And what I love about these new cell phones these days is these, you know, these, these mobile devices that are coming out with processors that um, are uh, significantly more powerful than you know, computers were you know, 10 years ago. And um, I just I just got a phone that uh, will take a terabyte chip, right? And we now have the capacity to put tons of information in these little devices. So I've got right now I'm wearing a uh, a library here. This is uh, um, uh, our um, uh, eGranary Academy, which is about twenty five thousand documents on how to do coding. <laughs> And you know, representing about a dozen different languages and, and uh, um, web design and all that kind of stuff. It's not just it's not just a bunch of websites about how to do it, but it's all the software that's needed to do it. And you know, and some uh, some Sakai, not Sakai, um, Moodle um, courseware, so to, to walk people through it. And that's this is what we're looking at: is being able to turn every smartphone, tablet, laptop, or thumb drive into a library. Somebody goes to the store and they buy one of these things. You know, the, the storage is empty. Why not have a free library on there immediately? But they've got they're walking out the store with 150,000 documents. Or, but the Ministry of Health or the Ministry of Education in the capital city can put together a collection and say, this is what our secondary students need for the next four years, and send them home with 100,000 documents. So it's the whole idea: of going to the library to check out a library. Or we meet in a bar, and you say, well, I've got an engineering library, and I say, well, you know, I've got a medicine library. And, hey, let me, let me make a copy. You know, we just pass our devices back and forth and make copies, and we trade off libraries. But the idea of being able to reach uh, underserved people in the, even the most remote areas, especially areas where solar power is the only option, and these little handheld devices are the only things that really function well. So, um, in that respect, this is where I want to recruit you guys. This is our, our Ebola emergency library. Um, you can still download it off of our server. Um, and uh, Ethiopia, we just said programming Ethiopia girls to code. And these girls have a little USB stick just like this, and they're able to um, go home with this library and uh, work through the materials on whatever device they could get their hands on. So, um, uh, that's the vision. So as, as we are working on updating our eGranary and this findability stack, we're also looking at shrinking all those applications as much as we possibly can so that we can put them adequately on a device like this. And we're working with about a dozen other groups that are doing some offline internet stuff. We founded a consortium last year. And most of them right now are doing shovelware. They get a piece of memory and they just shovel some stuff onto it. You know, a few hundred TED Talks, uh, a truncated Wikipedia, right? And they say, this is what you need. And that's kind of a top-down approach. We want to go out into the field, work with the people who are living in those communities and working in those communities, the information scientists at their universities, and say, let's find out what those educators want and need and put those into these kinds of collections. And, um, so the idea is we would have um, 
we're looking at a lot of features. We have some of these features already, some of these we need to be adding, but we're really looking at the sort of engine you know, on top of the operating system that provides all the basic services um, to, uh, um, uh, to run this little offline library. And then on top of that, we can plug in sort of these cartridges and silos of information. So with this piece done down here, that doesn't need to, get, nobody needs to reinvent that wheel. Open source, fully accessible, people can download this, put it on a stick, it might take 500 megabytes. But if they got a 32 gigabyte chip, they've got 31 gig left to put the content that they need. And the way we have, we, this silo system works already. We've, had, we, we've been using this for years, where we put our web content, the whatever downloadable software, the catalog, the index, and the data, um, the SQL, MySQL databases, in a certain form and function. And then when, um, so the idea is that anybody who's involved in this process can make a silo. They use the silo for secondary schools, here's a silo for medicine, here's a silo for, for nursing, whatever. And then, um, right now we have two silos in the grant. We have the eGranary silo, which is gargantuan. And we have the local silo, right? I was just making my website again. But um, we can add more. So the idea being that people can um, add and subtract things. When the, when the silos are registered, they're seen to the engine as just one big silo. And the user doesn't know that they're looking at um, at, uh, at multiple silos. So when they do a catalog you know, search, they're searching across all the silos. And these silos can be snapped in and snapped out. Then we already have this code developed. It's the, it's the engine that we're looking at right now to make all of this work well. So it all becomes one single, single view. And the idea is then to have this engine that anybody can Anybody in part of our consortium, anybody around the world can grab this engine and then they can just start building their own content on top of it to create local libraries. Um, there's no lack of really brilliant people anywhere in the world that I've worked who, you know, who are, who are, who wouldn't want to jump on this and learn how to do this stuff and make it happen. And so our, our mission now is just to, uh, get people engaged. We have some programmers in Ethiopia, we have some programmers in Zambia who are now helping us with some of the coding. And one of the things I'd love to do, especially if anybody here wants to get engaged with helping us make this engine, right, um, is, uh, is uh, couple you as a mentor to an African programmer. Because um, they need these skills as much as anybody here. So that's what we're up to. And once again, I want to thank you for the work that you do, making it open source and uh, making us look really awesome when we go out into the field and deploy this library because people think the, the catalog is the best part. Questions, observations, accusations? Yeah. Do you have plans to expand this to other countries? I mean, you know, you, you're focused on seems to be like Africa right now. But I mean, it seems like it's a great idea The under service places. There may even be places in America that are under service, especially inner city yeah. um, places yeah. and libraries, because they're I'm trouble funding libraries and things like that. So right. is there an idea to expand this and is there a way to like to like, donate to yeah, we're, we're one. We're we're ter terribly promiscuous. Um, <laughs> so really, I, we, you know, Papua New Guinea, India, we're all over the place. And basically, people call us and they say we don't we don't do a lot of promotion or anything like that. We're not really very good at it. Um, but people call us and they say, how can how can we get into this? Right? We need to develop. Um, and one of the reasons that we need to move to upgrade our stack is that. Um, we're, we've had some students working on a French language version, and now we have some students working on a Spanish language version, and we need to be able to move swiftly between all these other languages. Yeah. But there, in, in, in North Carolina, in Western North Carolina, out in the Appalachia re region, 50% um, of the school children there don't have access to the internet outside of school. So the idea of being able to send them home with a little library, right? And yeah, that, that's, that's ideal. Um, we're talking to people in Alaska who are working in really remote communities. Uh, yeah. 
So this 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 thing has legs. It can travel. Yeah. Um, how can you contribute uh, as a coder? Um, we got I got a list. Okay, so here's the trick. I have a list of about 150 things that we need to add. Okay, and every time we add something, and I go out to the field with a brand new e granary, and I show it off to people, and I I, I get some feedback. I come back with 150 more things. <laughs> so, <laughs> the need is the needs are never ended. But the whole idea is we're commoditizing this so that these universities and schools and organizations don't have to hire, you know, and and suffer <laughs> years and years of, of, of development to create this. It's just boom, it's there, and they can take this thing off the shelf and start working the next day. So, and, and if you if you just have to happen to have a lot of money, um, go to our website. <laughs> to the donate now because we really need it. <laughs> yeah, um, that's the, the one one skill I don't have is fundraising, and it's the one thing we need to do. So I, I wind up, I, I wake up every morning, I look at the ceiling and say, "Who the heck put me in charge of this? <laughs> what a bad idea!" Anyway, yeah. Um, I know that you're using a lot of open source software in this, but how much of the eGranary itself is open source? If you have the need for contributing developers or mentoring or have these 150 issues that multiply honestly, is there a place to go and contribute directly open source? Um, to the code? Yeah, all, all the code that goes in the eGranary is open source. Um, there's some of the tools that we use in the background to do the development on our side. You know, we'll, 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 you know, we'll get into it with anybody. But in terms of what goes out the door and what's what's on the on, on device is all open source. Um, because we want people in the field to be able to make their own changes and, and adapt it to whatever. Um, what was the other second part of that question? I think the question is more like if I wanted to go and look at your list of the issues yeah. and add changes, mm -hmm. is there is, is there like a GitHub where the, the actual eGranary code is? Or is that something that's still um, we're working on that. Okay. We need some help with it, actually. So, <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, but I can't tell you exactly. Okay. I have to ask the programmers. Now you guys keep track of this stuff. I know. I know we have a repository somewhere, and I know they have a feature list that they're working on, but I don't. I'm not sure uh, exactly where it is. But I can find out. Right. Yeah. And the other thing, you know, for us, like with Apache and all these other tools, we're looking at well, how how much of this can we strip out and 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 toss and and, and so for for this little pocket library, we obviously we we're not going to be doing indexing and cataloging on cataloging on this, right? So how much of that code can we strip out so we still have the basic functionality for the end user, and how much you know is it? We're we're you know we have limitless room on the server. We have from um, um, we're at six terabytes now, and our next version will be eight terabytes, and it's, it's going to be pretty full. But I'm, you know, I'm, I'm just that that makes that that's the one thing that makes my day is shifting to a, the next biggest hard drive. <laughs> so we plenty of room on that. I'm not seeing any questions from Twitter or on the on the field box, so. Cliff, Cliff, this is Leela. I've got one, a couple questions for you. Actually, more about how do you control for uh, your quality? If you're, if do you have any standards for um, cataloging that people have to follow if they're adding content to the eGranary? And also, what about obtaining copyright permissions? And how do how do you navigate that when you start opening up um, your contra your contributor list? Uh, okay, so um, do we have any standards? Yes, we do. Um, the, the catalog is is um, is not because we're cataloging virtually everything, which could be like an image or uh, an article or an entire journal or whatever. Um, uh, we use um, um, you know Library of Congress terms now, but we added we've added a few of our own. Um, we have a we have a mechanism where catalogers can submit catalog records and they get in inspected and approved by somebody who's sort of the uber cataloger. So that uh, it, we call it, we, um, uh, you know, call it cloud cataloging where 
people can create catalog records in one of our databases and then those get inspected and added to our catalog you know once they've been uh, once they've been combed over by somebody who's more familiar with um, our, our standards um, the second question was oh how do we handle copyrights and again we just um, we just contact the author and the publisher and um, uh, we have a little database that uh, generates these automatic messages and we explain to them what uh, what we're trying to accomplish and we just ask them directly for their permission and uh, uh, we have sometimes we have to do a little digging to make sure we're asking the right person and getting the right permission from the right person but uh, uh, yeah so it, and, and we have people around the world who are helping with that process they they log into our data it's a web interface they log into the database and they um, send out uh, the requests and then you know, document the responses yeah so it's old-fashioned we just ask for it yeah great thanks that's that's great that you've got at least some of that automated for sending off messages i can imagine with as many documents that you have that that can be a bit overwhelming to keep that all tracked properly right right yeah and the legal beagles are a little nervous about it they're like well you know different countries have different laws and blah 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 but you know if we have direct permission from the author and the publisher um you know and you know <laughs> in the end if somebody decides to sue us they're going to get mm, ten dollars um because <laughs> we're a small nonprofit and we don't have any money so <laughs> it doesn't behoove anybody um and uh you know the thing is we'll, we'll contact some organizations and we'll say can we have these are organizations whose mission the mission statement their dot org their mission statement is to serve the poor and we say can we have your website and they say absolutely not you may not touch our website We'll contact the next person, which is you know COM, and we we have we have journals in the e-granary that you and I have to pay for, right? Like the Mayo Clinic proceedings. They just said no, take the whole thing, right? Um, but uh, we contact some people, and they say totally you can have my website, and you can have this other website. I got this other website. I'll get this other website from my friend. And uh, a couple of weeks ago, we got this huge box in the mail full of DVDs for language instruction. You know, somebody who's like. <laughs> Yeah, and take all these too. <laughs> so we get we get the whole spectrum of, of uh, enthusiasm. Yeah, um, I really enjoyed your presentation. It was great. Um, I'm curious about other uh, sort of legal or policy. I'm wondering what more questions. Are there things that um, are there things that the countries are working on? For example, working in which they do. Could they be more supportive? For yeah, I think policy things that come up or things like that that kind of create a system where products like this work. I'm, I'm just very struck when I see a slide that shows the number of books to check out and it shows how um, India and China are so dominant on that slide. And it's like, are there things that those places do that can make things like this work better? Yeah. If you'd like to talk about this after we go to India. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, they have, they have, they put, they spend money on libraries and they, 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 Prioritizing and, and, and it's kind of important. It's really hard to maintain libraries in the tropics if you don't have air conditioning. Um, things just fall apart really fast. Um, and if the governments are coming and going frequently, it's hard to maintain um, the libraries. So um, what, what we run into one of one of the one of the greatest issues is cultural imperialism, right? Because the internet is like largely Western and highly U.S. centric, and we can. We can shock and awe other people with our communication uh, capacity. Um, so, um, and they, they have long experience with people coming in and just stealing their stuff, right? And uh, the librarians will tell you, they'll, they'll take me to a room in their library where there's all this unworking, you know, non-working um, digitization equipment. And somebody from the UK or from the US got a grant to spend three years there digitizing this university's collection. They digitized the collection and they took it away. 
And they might have left the librarian with a few DVDs, but the librarian doesn't know what to do with the DVDs. And now if they want their own information, they have to get on the internet and go to some website in the US or the UK. So they're really used to people coming in and, um, and pillaging their culture. So one of the reasons we have, we built the CIP, the idea that you can take 30,000 documents, zip it up into one file, upload it to the server, and unzip it, and boom, it's there. So we, we wanted to be in a space to say, okay, here's a bunch of information we can give you freely, but you can add as much as you want. So on every server, there's a terabyte of free space for them to take their own content and load it up there without us having to be a part of that process that makes it more politically and culturally um, manageable. Okay, well, thanks everybody. And uh, hope you enjoy your lunch. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>